When Alaskans created the Permanent Fund, it was a grand experiment. Other oil provinces had tried to preserve some of their wealth for future generations. Few, if any, had succeeded. Money! It's a gas. Nine years after statehood, the oil strike at Prudhoe Bay in 1968 ushered in a new era of prosperity for the 49th state. But while the state treasury received $900 million in lease bonuses the next year, the money was quickly spent, and Alaskans worried that more oil wealth would slip through their fingers. They became determined to cushion the boom and bust cycle that had plagued states and countries with natural resource wealth. Sheriff, Sheriff, don't take a for several years, legislators and residents debated what to do with the pending windfall. Eventually, they settled on a long-term savings account, an idea first put into legislation by Governor Keith Miller in 1970. Voters in 1976 decided on a constitutional amendment to set aside 25 percent of royalty and lease income from the oil fields. Today, the question is whether fund income can be used for government. As budget reserves shrink, the day of reckoning approaches on the state fiscal gap, and policymakers are revisiting the circumstances surrounding the creation of the permanent fund. Perhaps no other part of state government has undergone as much scrutiny. The investment policies gradually have been liberalized over the years, growing the fund to $25 billion and beyond, exceeding the dreams of its founders. The dividend program established in 1982 has given every resident a share of the oil wealth. But the dividend also has made for complicated discussions about the state's tax structure and about the civic obligations of Alaskans. Money. Get back. And as 2003 came to a close, there were competing proposals for constitutional amendments to change the structure of the fund or the dividend. If there's any consensus, it's that Alaska, due to the foresight of a generation of political leaders, has built itself an asset that is the envy of other states. Fund is the most successful experiment in public finance in any venue that I can think of, uh, particularly in a, in a free democratic process. It saves for the future some of the largesse of the present. It gives a dividend to encourage people to support that long-term goal. It protects the principal from the loss through inflation, and it takes a very small amount off the table for spending on an ongoing basis. Permanent Fund was created because we needed to protect ourselves from spending all the money. And we were starting to see how much was going to come in with the startup of the oil flowing through the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, how much revenue was going to come from that, and there was a the feeling that we needed to save some for when the oil ran out. We needed to protect ourselves from ourselves. We needed to leave a legacy for next generations. We needed to acknowledge that there would be needs when oil revenue dropped. The permanent funds seemed a way to answer all those questions. Well, there have been a lot of explanations of uh, why the permanent fund was created, most of which designed to serve some present political agenda. Uh, the real reason is clear. Uh, Alaskans just didn't think it made sense to let the politicians of that day have all of the oil money. And they wanted to set some of it aside for the future. And th there was no agreement about what that money should be used for or what that savings account should be used for. But there was wide agreement that it made sense to put some of it off limits to the government of the day. A lot of people recognize that Prudhoe Bay was a one-time shot, the largest oil field ever discovered in North America. 
we were going to pump the oil out of that. We were going to be rich for a while, but then the revenues would fall. And so eventually we would need some cushion, some other source of income to keep the state running. And this was a concern at the time of statehood. Uh, there were a lot of people who thought that Alaska couldn't support itself as a state because there were no obvious sources of um, public sector revenue. It's clear to me that one of the objectives that's inherent in the, amend in the, in the amendment itself and the discretion given to the legislature and the discussion at the time is that some, someday, the income, not the principal, but the income could be used to cover some of the losses as the wealth of Prudhoe Bay declined. No question about that in my mind. I think it's indisputable. That originally was intended as a sort of a rainy day account to buffer downturns in the budget. But today I think that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's become a sacred cow, which is beyond uh, uh, being tapped because of the permanent fund dividend. A lot of folk have contended the permanent fund was designed to be a rainy day account. I frankly don't remember that term even being bandied about back in those days. Had that been our desire, we would have not called it a permanent fund, but rather a semi-permanent fund that would be utilized when it started to rain. Rainy day, dream away. Let the sun take a holiday. Flowers bathe and see the children play. Lay back and groove. January 1975. The Ninth Legislature is convening, and we go down the halls, and it looks pretty much the same as it does today, except uh, the people are wearing these retro clothes, and they all have long hair. Governor Hammond, Jay Hammond, has just been elected governor. The Trans-Alaska oil pipeline hadn't been built, but it was under construction. And to quote Governor Hammond in his delightful autobiography, the scent of anticipated oil revenues waved like musk in the halls of the legislature. Well, I've been living like a trucker. I wanted to translate what I called oil wells pumping oil for a finite period into money wells pumping money for infinity. Well, that was not a popular idea in many quarters, but fortunately, a few legislators subscribed to that, uh, particularly Hugh Malone and uh, you know, Clem Tillian and Clark Greening and uh, uh, several others, enough others to create what they called a permanent fund. Unfor it didn't have a dividend program appended to it, which I felt was absolutely necessary in order to protect it nor was it other than statutorily structured. And I feared that if they needed more money, it would immediately be overturned. And therefore, I felt it necessary to be enshrined in the Constitution. Governor Hammond said, thank you very much, and promptly vetoed it, uh, saying that it, and correctly so, that it violated Section 7, Article 9 of our Constitution, which prohibited dedicated funds. And at the same time, he sent to us HGR 39, a proposed constitutional amendment. Sponsor substitute for House Joint Resolution Number 39 by the Rules Committee by request of the Governor. Proposing an amendment to the Alaska Constitution, establishing a permanent fund for certain proceeds derived from non-renewable resources. A permanent fund at the 25% level would result in an, uh, a pool of capital investment available for investment within Alaska in homes and in businesses and for the good of the people in the state of approximately $2.8 billion by 1985. It's an alternative approach to using state money rather than filtering it through the state bureaucracy. It's an approach that provides direct tangible benefits to the people of the state. 36 yeas, one nay, three excused. House Joint Resolution 39 has passed the House. 
Oddly enough, when it went to the ballot, there was a statement in, in favor and a statement in opposition. The statement in opposition was authored by none other than Tom Fink. A fiscal conservative would say you should never have a permanent fund. We develop a Midas syndrome. We like to count our money uh, instead of uh, doing things with it. The proposition was written by the Alaska State Chamber of Commerce. Now it is time for us to ask ourselves the question, when will oil and gas be depleted? And where will the funds to feed our giant government come from? The answer is the permanent fund. I have to confess that as I joined other legislators when we ran for re-election in 1976 in talking in that format. We talked about it as everything to everybody. It could do all things, diversify the economy, provide loans for housing, meet social goals, perhaps pay a dividend, and cover the cost of government on the downhill side of the Prudhoe Bay curve. You could see it in the eyes of candidates because no longer would you have to campaign on, on these on a platform of just limited means. You could campaign on dreams. I don't ever recall the word dividend being used, but Jim Rode and, uh, and Steve Cooper, who was, if I recall correctly, the uh, chairman and uh, chief aide for the House Finance Committee, wrote a report uh, about that time which discussed the, um, the possibility of, of a per capita payment. Everybody in the state, when they voted for it, knew that it would be used for governmental expenditures at some point in time, not a dividend. There was no discussion of a dividend when the Constitutional Amendment was voted on by the people. That's completely false. I, that's one of the reasons I ran for governor. I, I discussed that frequently on the campaign trail, the Alaska Inc. concept, creating an investment account, spinning off dividends. I, reiterated my experience in Bristol Bay and how I thought it was absolutely necessary to do the same, something of that nature with our oil wealth or we'd end up as, again, so often is the case, overspending and finding we couldn't sustain these programs. So I, I pronounced that at virtually every gathering. And I think it's pretty much the conclusion of most people that if we had no dividend program, the permanent fund would long since been invaded and probably gone. At least that's been the experience, again, of every other state and nation, according to the World Bank. They said Norway is second best in their view, and they contended, I didn't know this, that Norway had copied theirs in large measure after our approach. Uh, a similarity between ourselves and the Norwegian Fund, uh, as I perceive it, is that uh, we are, are both uh, providers of new capital within our borders. We provide income that we earn from Wall Street to the citizens in the state of Alaska and the citizens of Alaska. Norway, by investing outside of Norway, provides new money, new capital from outside of Norway into their country. What's the story going to be? The story is going to be about the dividend. It's very fascinating that government handing out uh, money to the people. And I think the best thing is uh, the way the electorate protect the fund from short-sighted politicians. But maybe the protection is too good. It's, if you're running deficits at the government, you, you shouldn't do that. You should solve that problem. And it seems to be impossible because of the electorate are protecting the fund so very, very well. Rain a day, rain all day. Ain't no use in getting up tired. Just let it groove its own way. Let it drain the worries away. Lay back and